In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our spiritual exercises program, and we're already entering into the seventh week of our ten week program. It's great to be with you. And we always like to start off our conversation by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary is, uh, she's the mother of God, she's the mother of the church, and as the Filipinos will often say, Mama Mary, she's our mother too. As well as we cry out to Mary and the Hail Holy Queen. Mary is our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So let's start off by saying the prayer that she loves most. And that's the Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. We like to invite our spiritual guide to be with us. Spiritual guide is the Holy Spirit. We're about to be celebrating one of the most important feast days in in honor of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost. The Holy Spirit has many beautiful names. Paraclete. He's also known as the gift of gifts. He's known also as the consoler, counselor. He's known also as the sweet guest of the soul. And St. Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 8, we don't always know how to pray as we ought. But the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans, so we can say Abba. Abba, which means Papi or Daddy. So let's invite the Holy Spirit to be with us in our conversation and then during the course of our meditations that He'll be our guide. He'll lead us into the fullness of the truth. And that truth is Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. So let's say the classical prayer to the Holy Spirit. And it's this. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation to the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady, Spouse of the Holy Spirit, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. Saint Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. Saint Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So my friends, uh, we're building a 10-story edifice. We have placed the foundation, we're going to be building upon the seventh floor this week. So briefly, let's just recap what we've built already. And we're building in our lives an edifice of sanctity, as Jesus says, be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. You remember six weeks ago we talked about the purpose of our existence. We are here not like a chicken with its head cut off. We're not like a driver without a map or electronic map. Or like a sailor, there's no port. Or an archer that can't even find the target. We know where we came from. We know where we're heading. We know the steps we have to take. 
and we know how to get there. We are here to praise God. We're here to reverence God. We're here to serve God. And by means of that, to save our souls. So in the background of all your meditations, you have that. That's the foundation. It's called principle and foundation. And now when you're making decisions for yourself, for your family, for your children, for your teenagers, you're always thinking, is this going to glorify God? And is this going to help them to get to heaven? That should be our mental process in all decisions, especially the important ones. Is this going to glorify the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit? This is going to be a bridge by which my children can arrive at their eternal destiny, which is heaven. So you see the exercises are changing your thought process. And of course our thought process leads to our decision making. My father, may he rest in peace, taught us a lot of proverbs. One was, the thought is the father of the deed. How true. What we think, we end up by doing. Therefore, you are a PNF person, principal and foundation person. You're motivated by, how can I glorify God? And how, how, how can I save my soul and save the souls of those entrusted to me and try to save the whole world? Remember the call of the king. Then we had to encounter our major obstacle, our roadblock, our spiritual detour. And that is the reality of sin. So you're begging for the grace to see sin through the divine perspective. And you meditate upon the sin of the angels, the sin of Adam and Eve, and the sin of someone who committed mortal sin was lost because of that. We mentioned also the immortal saying of Pope Pius XII back in the 40s of last century. He said, the sin of the century is the loss of the sense of sin. We can become desensitized to sin because we're surrounded by a sinful world. And we can become accustomed to sin. The exercises teaches us that that's wrong. We can't follow the way of sin. We have to follow Jesus Christ and his teaching. Because he's the way, the truth, and the life. Then the following week we meditate upon those very serious topics helping us once again to renounce sin and to choose Christ in our lives. We meditate upon the reality of death, judgment, heaven, hell, purgatory, and the reality of eternity. That heaven and hell will be forever and ever and ever. And as the Lady Fatima said, about a hundred years ago, if we would meditate upon eternity, we would be converted and saved. How short life is. The great doctor of the church, the doctor of grace, his name is St. Augustine, says that our life in comparison with eternity is a mere blink of the eye. A mere blink of the eye. How transitory, how ephemeral, how quickly life passes by. So the exercises are going to help us to focus on what's most important. God and our eternal salvation. Then we meditated upon sin as a reality within our own hearts. And we're begging for the grace of self-knowledge to know ourselves as the fathers of the church invite us with that two-word maxim, know thyself. So you meditate upon what are called the seven capital sins. These seven capital sins are seven 
proclivities are tendencies within us. They're bad tendencies. They're sinful tendencies. That if we do not resist them, then we can become slaves of the capital sins and actual sins. What are they? Gluttony, lust, avarice, sloth, envy, anger, and pride. You might be thinking, well, Father, I've got, I've got all of those within me. Well, you're probably not far from the mark. I think we all have some of those tendencies within us. However, there's going to be a predominant one. A predominant one. And once you're able to detect that, then you can work to, to do what's called the Ajare Contra, which means to practice the opposite virtue. And we presented to you the opposite virtue of those capital sins. And that led us into the following week. Fifth week was the week of God's mercy. The greatest attribute of God is His mercy. And the culmination of that fifth week was that all of you are going to prepare yourself to make a general confession. The best confession in your lives. We've got spring cleaning, but also we've got soul cleaning, right? Spring cleaning, but there has to be soul cleaning. That's why you have Father Broom with you, a clean sweep with Father Broom. Amen? <laughs> clean sweep with Father Broom. <laughs> and you had to find uh, a priest that would be available to hear a little bit longer confession and for if it were difficult to, to find the time, the place, and the priest that was, that was available, it's understandable. But even have it, if you haven't done your confession yet, before the program is over, it's a good idea to, to find a, the opportunity to make a general confession. Because that's part, part and parcel of our program. You know why? is because over the past 50 to 60 years, as a whole, there's been a real lack of good, solid catechesis. And a lack of catechesis on moral theology, on the Ten Commandments, and on confession could be that maybe, maybe you haven't really made a good confession. Maybe you still have a lot of that junk stored up in your attic or your basement. Or maybe both. You know, you, if you're trying to walk around in your basement, your attic, and you've got a lot of trash there, you're probably going to trip and fall. We, our, St. Teresa of Avila says that our home, our soul, is like, it's like a castle. And if it's just filled with junk, the king of the castle, Jesus Christ, cannot move about freely. So it'd be very opportune if you could actually make that confession within the next 24 hours as we prepare for Pentecost and as we move into another stage of the exercises. So that's the fifth week. God's infinite mercy related to the sacrament of mercy, we also call it confession. Then last week, you meditated upon the call of the king. You're praying for the grace not to be deaf to the call. Did you hear me? Okay. Praying for the grace not to be deaf to the call. Did you hear me? Hopefully you heard me. Okay. And that call the king is really, according to Father John Hardin, confirmation is the call to the apostolate. The call of the king for St. Ignatius is the call to the apostolate, to try to Bring souls to Christ. The harvest is rich, the labors are few. Culpus for Christ has a great mission to be apostles. You know, apostles within their own hearts, apostles within their own families, apostles in the whole world, starting in our own 
hearts to be con converted. And then try to be apostles because charity begins at home. Couples for Christ is designed to, to work in forming good families and having Christ in the center. And then going out to the whole world. The last words of Jesus in the Gospel are, go out to the whole world, teach, baptize. I'm with you always until the end of the world. And then you also meditate upon those charming, endearing mysteries, which are the joyful mysteries. The joyful mysteries. This is a very Marian program. Very Marian program where we're begging for the grace and the exercise to contemplate the face of Christ through the eyes and heart of Mary, in the words of John Paul II. I repeat, to contemplate the face of Jesus through the eyes and the heart of Mary. What better way? So there we are, my friends. This week, the seventh week, I like to call this the week of the Ignatian Classics. The Ignatian Classics. So we're going to be giving you a, a series of meditations that are going to be spiritual weapons that are going to help you to fight the good fight, to run the good race for the rest of your lives. These are spiritual, these are spiritual weapons, spiritual tools to help you in your struggle to become saints, to overcome the devil, the flesh, and the world, to arrive at your eternal destiny, which is heaven. So we have, I'm going to cover uh, these basic themes. First is, is the two standards. Then we have what is called the three classes of men. Then we have the three grades of humility. And we'll end by presenting to you a plan of life. And I actually brought today, uh, this is the third book that I actually wrote, uh, Road Map to Heaven. I invite all of you, if you could, eventually to purchase this. This will help you to uh, fill in some of the gaps on the exercises. This is related to your plan of life that I'll be speaking about at the end of our talk today. So let's, uh, let's dive in. The first contemplation that you're going to be doing this week is called the two standards and it would be the standard of Christ and then you have the standard of Satan. Ignatius presents it in this way. He presents Satan in Babylon, which means the city of confusion. He's sitting in a dung heap. He's surrounded by other devils. He is hideous in, in appearance, very ugly. He's surrounded by smoke. And he's giving a discourse to his allies in evil, the devils. Go out there and try to trap them by riches, honor, fame, materialism. Go out that. Go out there and use those tools to trap people and to drag them in the net to me. So there you have Satan. On the other side, you got Christ. And he's in the city of Jerusalem. He's standing up. He's surrounded by his disciples. 
He's very attractive. And he's inviting his followers to go out and to preach the importance of poverty. Being detached from material things. From humility. Not seeking fame and honors. Humiliations. Even humiliations that, that keep us humble. Even though it's difficult to say this, but to be humble, God has to sometimes humble us through humiliation. <laughs> Painful as that might sound, it's so true. So, they, so Jesus is, is giving this discourse to his disciples, sending them out. So what I'd like to do now, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about talking about the the devil and the way the devil can work in our lives. That's the first standard. The standard of devil, and then we have the standard of Christ. The devil. Who is the devil? And what are the different ways that the devil can work in our lives? My friends, uh, Pope Paul VI, he made this statement, with respect to the devil, there are two extremes that we want to avoid. First is, we don't want to deny the existence of the devil. In certain intellectual academic spheres, the devil is rejected. He is trivialized as a comical figure, dressed in red pajamas with a pointy tail with a pitchfork. No? And when that scene is trivialized, we kind of laugh him off as some mythical figure of the Middle Ages. Of only uneducated people believe in that guy in red pajamas with the pointy tail and the pitchfork. And ironically, behind that often is the devil himself. The devil trying to convince us that he doesn't exist. It's ironic because by convincing us that he doesn't exist, he can work much more powerfully in our lives. It's like two enemy forces. If an army knows that another army is encroaching upon them, then they can put up a strong defense. But if they don't know the enemy is approaching, then they won't be able to defend themselves. So the devil, we're, we're talking now about spiritual warfare. You know, my friends, we are in spiritual warfare. We're in spiritual combat. And the book of Revelation says the devil knows his, sh his time is short. So he knows his time is short. He's going to do all he possibly can to win us over to drag us into the pit where he is. He'll use all the means possible to seduce us, to lie to us, to play on our emotions, to play mind games on us so that he can trick us, deceive us into winning us over. So, that's one extreme that has to be avoided, is to deny the existence of the devil. On the other extreme is we don't want to be giving too much importance to the devil. I think we've all met people, Christians and Catholics, that you talk to them and it's almost if every other, every other sentence they mention the devil. Now that's too much. So by doing that, we're actually empowering the devil in our lives. 
So the denial of the devil, the overemphasis on the devil, are means by which the devil can be all the more powerful in our lives. And we should never forget that God is much more powerful than the devil. Mary is much more powerful than the devil. Our guiding angel is much powerful than the devil. But if we're walking without God, without Mary, without the angels, without the saints, we are e an easy prey for the devil. Because the devil is, he is a fallen angel. He still has intelligence, but a perverted intelligence. Bent upon pulling us away from God in time and for all eternity. So, those are two extremes that have to be avoided. I like to talk about ways in which the devil can tempt us after mentioning some of the names that we have for the devil. What are some of the biblical names for the devil? Well, he's known in the book of Revelation, which refers to Genesis as the ancient serpent the serpent that tempted Adam and Eve. He's also known, Jesus calls the devil in John chapter 8, he calls him the father of lies and a murderer from the beginning. Whenever I think about that, I think about the whole reality of abortion. Father of lies and a murderer from the beginning. He's also known as the prince of this world. Another name for the devil is demon, as well as Satan, as well as Lucifer. Lucifer refers to the beautiful star of the morning before he fell. The, the devil is also known as Beelzebub, Translated, that would be, <clears throat> he's the Lord of the Flies. These are biblical names for the devil. The saints have also given short definitions of the devil. St. Thomas Aquinas, the angelic doctor, gives an interpretation as to really the function of the devil. He's known as the tempter. St. Ignatius himself calls the devil the enemy of our human nature. St. Augustine says that the devil is, can be compared to an angry, vicious dog on a chain. So if you get close to a pit bull and the chain is short, that pit bull can bite and do a lot of damage on that leg. <laughs> but the, So we have to be wary about the workings of the devil. Now St. Peter actually calls the devil, a, he's like a roaring lion, lion searching he who he can devour. And Peter says, resist and be solid in your faith. So those are various names that we have from the devil, biblical names as well as the lives of the saints. So let's talk about some of the tactics of the devil. All right. Up to this point, we've gone through 11 of the rules for discernment, and we're going to be giving you the last three rules in conjunction with the devil and the two standards. If you remember, we've gone through the rules. The rules are basically this. We have these various movements within us. <clears throat> we have one movement which is drawing us toward God, the other one is trying to draw us away from God. This is the art of spiritual discernment. 
And when you have this movement within you, drawing you toward God, open up your heart and follow that. That's called an inspiration. But when you have the bad movement within you, you have to reject it. Now, in the Rules for Discernment, and I brought the classical book of the exercises that all of you eventually may buy, by Lewis Poole, Chicago Press. One of the key elements to understand the rules for discernment is the reality of desolation. Desolation is a state of soul that we all experience during the course of our lives. It's part of being human, we go through states of desolation where you feel there's a lack of faith, a lack of love, a lack of charity, you feel uh, sad, depressed, disoriented. Uh, you, uh, you're kind of going through a dark tunnel. Life doesn't really seem that meaning. People don't seem to understand me. Wherever you go, people seem to have frowns on their faces. You want to give up. As the athletes say, just throw in the towel and give up. Now, when you find yourself in a state of desolation as such, that is when the devil will tempt you. So you have to be very, very careful when you find yourself in that state of desolation because the devil is aware of that and he's, he's going to go after your juggler's vein. He will. So remember when you're in a state of desolation, make no changes. Be faithful to your holy hour. And then rule six says, hey, pr pray, meditate, a little bit of penance, examine your conscience. All right. Another, another tool that the devil will utilize is the following. And by means of a story, it's taken from the, the diary of St. Faustina Kowalska, the di diary of Divine Mercy in my soul. St. Faustina is, uh, is moving from one convent to another. She's being transferred frequently. In one convent, she's uh, in the corridor and she sees the devil. The devil is running back, back and forth, frenetically, with great anxiety, very nervous. And the devil is going back and forth, and Jesus tells Faustina to stop the devil and ask the devil, what is the, what is the biggest tool he uses to tempt people to fall into sin. So Faustina says, under obedience, Jesus says, you must tell me and us right now, what is the tool you use to get people to fall into your trap? And the devil said, laziness. 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 St. John Bosco, who worked with young people, he lamented for the time of vacation when he had to send back his young people to their homes because they had nothing to do. If you don't have anything to do, then the devil's going to give you a lot to do. So that's another tool that the enemy will use. Is uh, is giving in to the capital sin of sloth. All right. Now I'm going to move into explaining the two standards by explaining the last three rules for discernment. So that would be rule rule 12, 
13 and 14. Now these rules for discernment, the devil is present at least implicitly in all the rules. But rule 12, 13, and 14, we see the devil presented by St. Ignatius very explicitly in how he works. The, the twelfth rule, he, he says the devil is like, well, it has to be said, like a street woman. Like a street woman. And he says that the devil is basically like, basically like this. He's, he's strong with the weak and he's weak with the strong. That woman of the street, she sees the possibility of a possible client falling into her snares. She becomes powerful and overpowers that individual that, that, that is weak and vacillating, irresolute, without any determination. However, that's the way the devil works. He sees that you're weak and you're about to give in. He becomes all the more powerful and he just bowls you over. Like a powerful wind. But if you're strong, then the devil becomes weak. And he recoils. And he leaves you alone for another time because he's going to come back. <laughs> you know, the devil never goes on vacation. He works 24-7. And of all the vices, the devil is not lazy. And the devil is not lazy. He's vicious, he's envious, he's angry, he's bitter. But the devil is not lazy. He works 24-7. So that's, uh, that's rule 12. That the devil is weak with the strong and he's strong with the weak. So as soon as you're aware of a temptation from the devil, you have to manfully resist it right away, rejecting it. And never forget that a, a temptation is not a sin. Some people confuse temptation with sin. Once heard a story of a, a man that was talking to a priest, and um, the priest asked the man, well, Bill, did you entertain bad thoughts? And Bill said, no, they entertained me. <laughs> I, can, uh, I can see you laughing at that, uh, that, that story, but the story says a lot. Bill, did you entertain bad thoughts? No, they entertained me. So that would be a sin. He purposely entertained the bad thoughts. So as soon as you're aware of the bad thoughts, you have to reject them right away. Reject them right away. Okay, then the thirteenth rule is the following. When we're in the state of desolation, the devil does not want us to open up, but to keep that desolation, that turmoil, that sadness, that depression, that hopelessness, just keep it to yourself. And thereby, he, he turns a molehill into a mountain. It's like you've got a, you got a cut in your hand. If you don't tend to that cut, then it becomes infected. And then even more infected. Then gangrene. Man, amputation. So we have to learn when we're in the state of desolation not to keep it to ourselves but to be able to open up to a spiritual director or confessor. Father Tim Gallagher, an oblate priest who has written on the rules for discernment, he gives the example of St. Therese of Lisieux the little flower. She's about to make her perpetual vows and all hell breaks loose. She has these thoughts, and it comes from the devil, that she's not called to become a religious. 
she is in a profound state of desolation. And what she does is exactly what St. Ignatius says we should be doing. She speaks to her novice mistress saying, I, I feel like I'm tempted, that I'm not called to become a religious, I'm in a state of desolation. And the novice mistress says, full steam ahead. That's the enemy working on you. Then to give the devil another knockout, she tells Mother Superior. And Mother Superior, like the novice mistress, say, no, that's the enemy. Calm down. You'll make your vows tomorrow. She made her perpetual vows and became one of the most famous modern saints. But the devil is trying to give her a hammer blow to knock her out of the convent because the devil, I think, saw if this young woman becomes a religious, she's probably going to do a lot of good. And she'll steal a lot of souls from me. Yes. So before major triumphs, often the devil is present. Probably even before starting these exercises, all hell broke loose. No, I can't do this. It's too much. In an hour a day, 10-week program, uh, I won't be able to do it. Maybe I'll do it next year when, when I feel better. The devil is present before major victories. Before major victories. So be aware of that. So the thirteenth rule is, when we find ourselves in desolation, we have to find someone to open up our hearts to, a confessor or a spiritual director. And once we do that, we knock the wind out of the sails of the devil. The devil wants to turn that molehill into a mountain. The molehill even disappears. Okay, then the, four, the 14th rule, my friends, we're talking about the two standards. I'm talking about the way that the enemy, the devil, works on us. I like to call it the kryptonite rule. So Ignatius presents this 14th rule by means of a medieval analogy. Imagine a, a fortress, a castle a feudal structure that's surrounded by a moat. And in that castle, there's a lot of valuable, valuable things. What does the devil want? What does the enemy want to do? He's going to be circling around to see where there's an opening so that he can enter into the castle. He can plunder and sack and he can take the booty and the expensive items that are present there. That castle, Teresa of Avila calls it the interior castle. That castle is our heart. That castle is our soul. So what does the devil do? He's going to be circling around, going around, circling around to see where there is an opening, where there's a crack in the structure, where there's a leak in the roof, where there's an opening in the cellar. He's going to be circling around to see where there's an opening. And he will enter at the first opportunity that presents itself. To do this, it might be a good idea to review the capital sins to see what is your basic weak point. Is it gluttony? Is it lust? Is it avarice or greed? Is it sloth or laziness? Is it envy? Is it anger? Is it pride? Now we have, we all have those tendencies within us, but there is a major weak point. So, those are reflections on the ways in which the enemy works on us ways in which the enemy works on us. And within our lives, within our souls, we're going to be having this constant battle day after day. We have the standard of Satan who has the purpose to tempt us so that we can fall into his trap. 
Then we have the standard of Christ. And he calls us, Christ calls us to follow him. And we should be aware of the, the attraction, the glimmer, the seduction of the devil. We have to be aware of that. But we should feel a stronger desire to follow Christ. We should pray that Christ will be magnetic in our life. That there's a real magnetism. We want, we want to follow Christ. And St. Ignatius says we should beg how often Ignatius says we have to become like beggars? He says we should beg the saints that we would be accepted under the standard of Christ. We should beg the angels that we will be accepted under the standard of Christ. We should beg the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mary Most Holy, that we will be accepted under the standard of Christ. So, this... Uh, meditation on the two standards is going to be helpful the rest of your lives to fight the good fight, to recognize that we are truly in spiritual combat. Until our last breath, we are in spiritual combat. But never forget that the devil exists, but our help is the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. If God is with us, who can be against us? We are on the winning side if we stand beneath the standard of Christ. All right. You move into another one of your meditations this week, and it's called the... It's called the three classes of men. So the two standards is basically directed at trying to be aware, aware intellectually of the different tactics the enemy uses to seduce us, to tempt us. So we fall into his trap. Whereas the three classes of men is directed more at our will. To fortify our will in the following of Christ. In this, I'd like to present three biblical, three biblical uh, depictions of three different types of, of, of wills. So the first would be, Jesus calls the rich young man to follow him. And the rich man, young man simply says, no. And the reason is because his possessions actually possess him. He is, he is attached, bound to material things. He was, he was a good young man, but not good enough. Christ wanted him to become a saint. And you are following me. I'm sure that you are good people. But you're not good enough yet. No offense. You're good people, but you're not good enough. And you might be attached to something. We, we, we go back to principle and foundation, holy indifference. We're not. We shouldn't be prefer long life to short life, health over sickness, riches over poverty, honors over humiliations. But we choose what is most conducive to the end for which we're created, the honor and glory of God and our salvation. So that's the first, the rich young man who allowed himself to be possessed by his possessions and consequently he never followed Christ. 
In prayer this week, you have to ask yourself, are, are you attached to something in such a way that that prevents you from giving yourself totally to Christ? If I had two hands filled with diamonds and said to you, I would like to give you these diamonds, but you had your two hands filled with sawdust or dirt, until you open up your fists and you relinquish that sawdust, I can't put those diamonds in your hands. And sometimes, my friends, we're clinging to sawdust. We're clinging to broken eggshells. We're clinging to dirt. Whereas God wants to give us treasures. Because Christ is a pearl of infinite price. He's our treasure. God should be the treasure of our lives. And the more that God is a treasure of your life, the more you're going to be blessing your family and the other families that you have contact with. Okay, let's take the second class. Okay, so the first class is the rich young men. The second class would be Jesus is heading toward Jerusalem and he's inviting people to follow him. So in the second class, you actually have three different individuals. Jesus says to one, come and follow me. The man says, well, I just bought a field and I bought some animals. So I, have to tend, I have to tend first to that. And then after that, I'll follow you. And Jesus is moving along, heading toward Jerusalem. And he meets another man and he says, come and follow me. Hey, I just got married. Let me go on my honeymoon. Let me go on my honeymoon. See, I have to understand, Lord, I'm just married. Hey, come on, give me some time to go. Maybe from Canada to Niagara Falls. You know, they're up there in upper state New York. You cross over Niagara Falls, you're into Canada. You cross over that, you're into New York. <laughs> well, Jesus uh, doesn't give that guy permission to go on his honeymoon yet. Then Jesus moves on and he says, come and follow me. And this time, this man says, well, Lord, you know, my father just died. Let me bury my father. Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. You come and follow me. So these three men are what we might call would-be followers. These three men are what we might call conditional followers. Lord, I will follow you, but under my condition. You might even call them but followers. I will follow you, Lord, but after I am able to do this. You know what we have to do? We got to kick the butt in the butt. <laughs> got to kick the butt in the butt. So they never followed Christ. And then let's arrive at the third class. And over the years, I've liked to present the person of St. Matthew. Jesus goes to Matthew, who's sitting at the custom post. He's a tax collector. Jesus says to Matthew, three words, come follow me. Immediately, Matthew leaves everything to follow Christ. And I believe it was a penetrating gaze of love of Christ. That the loving gaze of Christ peered into the eyes of Matthew and he melted. He capitulated. He left everything, opened up his house, offered a banquet to Christ. He invited his friends so that upon encounter Christ, they would follow Christ too. Probably a motley group of individuals, right? Prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners. But Matthew knew if these people see Christ, they'll want to follow him as I'm following. So my friends, 
That's the three classes of men. Here's the question. What class do you find yourself in? I think I can tell you. Maybe a little bit of the three. Maybe a little bit of the three. At times, we're like the rich young man and we don't want to follow Christ. We just want to cling to our toys. We want to cling to our sawdust. And we don't want to open up to relinquish so God can give us those diamonds. Christ is the diamond. Other times, yeah, Lord, I'll follow you, but wait a little bit. I've got some plans which are maybe more important than your plans. Let me get these done and then I'll follow you. Then on those good days, we're like Matthew. Jesus looks into our eyes and says, come and follow me. Lord, I will follow you right now. We have to aim at being like Matthew. So we have to look very closely at ourselves and see what are we still attached to and to relinquish these attachments. To get those sharp, sharp scissors and cut so that we can experience the freedom of the sons and daughters of God. Then, my friends, you're going to be meditating upon also what's called the three grades of humility. And what we're doing by the three grades of humility, we're going back to earlier meditations, but we're going deeper. Because what Ignatius does, he's going to be repeating similar themes, but going deeper and deeper and deeper. And the nation is going to challenge us to prefer, think about this, this is going to be challenging. What is mortal enemy number one in our lives? It's the reality of sin. So we want to, with Ignatius and the saints, prefer to die rather than commit a mortal sin. On June 3rd, we celebrate the feast of Charles Luanga and companions. Charles Luanga, the king was tempting him to commit a homosexual act. Charles Luanga and his companions. Charles Luanga said no. He was actually burnt alive, as well as some of his companions. Another would be St. Maria Goretti. These are saints. And they recognize that our body is important, but our soul in heaven is more important. Our body is important, but our soul and obedience to God goes even beyond our bodily life. Then the second grade of humility is we don't want to give in to a deliberate venial sin. We're living in a world where sin is so it's so ubiquitous. It's so omnipresent. So we can become desensitized. We don't want to be giving into that white lie or that gossip or purposely, okay, I'm going to be uh, overeating. I'm going to be looking at the TV with that a couple of bad scenes. But we don't want to do that. We want to fight the good fight, run the good race. We want to reject all sin from our lives. Then the third degree of humility is God so wills it to undergo humiliations for Christ, to imitate Jesus all the more. And when we meditate upon the passion of Christ, especially the crowning with thorns, we see how many humiliations Christ went through and how proud I am at times. God sends a, a small humiliation, I start to fuss and they start to get angry. And they throw a pity party. Why me? So humiliation, they're going to come, whether you like it or not. When the humiliations come, they're, they're the two standards. Anger and vindictive, vindictiveness. I'm, I'm going to get even with that person. Or, I'm humiliated, I'll united to Christ for my own sanctification and for the conversion of sinners. And finally, my friends, what we want you to do is to write out your own plan of life. You're going to be writing out your own plan of life. I've given you a couple. A chronological, what can you do 
in your spiritual life every year, every month, every week, every day, every hour, every minute. And then there's a professional plan of life. How can you improve as father or mother, as wife, as professional, in your spiritual life, in your penitential life, in your apostolic life, in your permanent formation? And this is called so that we can order the disorder in our lives. My friends, we all have disorders. If you can hammer out a plan of life, that is going to help you to order the disorder and experience peace. St. Augustine defines peace as the tranquility of order. And I invite all of you to try to obtain from 10 publishers my last book, Roadmap to Heaven, which is a Catholic plan of life. This will help you to order the disorder and experience the true freedom of the sons and daughters of God. So my friends, this week is very important. I've given you what are called the Ignatian tools so that you can arrive safe and sound at your heavenly destiny. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.